Dyker Begg is a Jungian oriented psychotherapist and astrologer with well over 30 years of experience. She's both lecturer and author and has obtained the notable diploma of the Faculty of Astrological Studies in the UK. She's also a fellow and the media officer of the Association of Professional Astrologers International. In the popular media, Dyker is better known as Stella Beck, even having appeared as an agony aunt for various outlets. In 2001, she published Synchronicity, The Promise of Coincidence, which is based on Carl Jung's theory of an a-causal connecting principle, or a meaningful coincidence. And this subject will feature in today's interview. Hello, Dyke. Hello, James. I'm very well. I'm very pleased to speak to whoever is listening to this. Welcome to our Raphael's interview. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about what you're up to at the moment. Well, I've got a very busy practice. In fact, I've been practicing over 40 years now. Yeah. Uh, so that's my day-to-day -day <laughs> routine, especially weekends for people who work during the week. And I am, I've been researching for a number of years now my next book, and it's the third one. I've written one before, Synchronicity, as well, on a rebirthing, which is based on a breathing therapy. And I'm working on this third one, which has to do with the integration of the positive animus in women, so finding their inner masculine side. Right. So that's a long project because uh, the goalposts change all the time. All the time I'm uh, learning more, and of yeah. course it comes from my practice with clients, and astrology yeah. very much features in that, um, as uh, we might be talking about the animal animus later on. So that's the big, my, my big over... Uh, my, the main um, interest I have outside normal astrological and psychotherapeutic practice. How did you first become interested in astrology? Well, it's very odd. I sort of vaguely knew about astrology. My mother talked about sun signs. But, you know, I, I have to say, when I came to astrology, I was 28 years old. I had no idea whatsoever that you could study it. Yeah. And just before my 28th birthday, I saw a book in a shop window called The Complete Astrologer by the, by the Parkers. Yeah. And it struck me like a lightning. I thought, what? You can buy a book on that? And I'd lived a pretty sheltered life. <laughs> and, um, and so I, I bought it there and then. And by midnight on that night, on that day, I had actually set up my own chart and promptly wrote to the authors who then I said, how do I know it's, it, I've, I've really corrected, you know, I've done it correctly. Yeah. So Julia Parker wrote straight back and gave me the details of the Astrological Association and the lodge and also told me how to check it. She said it's a 24 hour clock and if you more or less got the time right, then the chart right, then the sun should be where uh, roughly uh, at, the, at the hour when you were born. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote to the Lodge and the uh, Astrological Association, and um, uh, only the Astrological Association wrote back. And we shortly after that, we moved to, to Chiselhurst in Kent, and I was five minutes' drive away from Charles Harvey, oh, the president yes. of the then. And we became very, very close friends, and I became part of his research team, and we were doing an enormous amount of work together. And within a year, I was holding various positions in the Astrological Association. So I always say, I never found astrology, it found me. Mm. So it, it's really, it meant to happen. It, I, it was probably the right time. Um, and uh, I was also at the time uh, when I found it, just after I got pregnant with my third child, a son, who has Mercury and Uranus on the ascendant when he was born. Yeah. So I always <laughs> say that that pregnancy brought in the astrology. So. That's that's how I came to it, and I've never looked back. Right. Yeah. Yes, you don't, do you? No. Um, well, I mean, what do you see as um, astrology's real role? Well, um, well, I mean, the, the simple answer is relating our personal little life to the greater life, to the greater whole, and yes. as quantum physics is doing on the on on that level. Yeah. Um, and um, and to realize that we are. A lot more than who we are. In fact, yesterday I saw the film Lucy with um, Scarlett Johansson, and that sort of with um, 
with Morgan Freeman yeah. as yeah. the scientist. And that kind of reminded me again of what we are moving towards, a greater and greater consciousness. And I think astrology, if it's applied properly and not just sort of, you know, your mother never loved you and now you're looking for love in every relationship kind of thing, if you apply to, to a much greater... Uh, vision, which is which is really, I think, if I can call it a mission, but that's my objective. Um, then you, I think, gradually within the collective psyche of human beings, we will get that greater vision that we are more than this little bit of consciousness in a body. Mm, that there absolutely. is far more, and and all, and I would imagine certainly this is so for me. All astrologers who know that trade very well. And um, you know there is very little else to learn on the you know with the basic astrology. They actually find that they they learn more things that they never knew and they'd never been taught by anybody. It comes out in the work, and so it's almost like you know the body of astrology is instructing us as we're actually working with it. So. You know, its greater role is basically to to make us realize that we are far more than what we are. And if, if a, a nosological reading goes well, a person says, "My God, I had no idea," you know, that that's me. Um, yeah. If it's done in the right way, otherwise it won't stick. So it's got to be the right kind of you know characteristics that one attaches to this chart. Otherwise, a person won't actually accept it. In a way, you've answered uh, my next question, which was going to be about how do you think it works? It's um, yes. it's not cause and effect, is it? Well, I think it's 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 both. Okay. Because I've been really thinking about this, and people say, oh, you know, it's not causal, and uh, you know, you know, they say some people outlive their birth chart, and I certainly know certain people who are unaffected by planetary transits. Yeah. And so people say, oh, yeah, but they don't have an effect. Well. Uh, how come that we can predict astrologically, let's say, when Saturn comes to someone's descendant, let's yeah. say, yeah. to the point of marriage, and the marriage is on the rocks anyway? Well, it's, a fair, it's fairly logical and obvious that the relationship is heading for a breakup. Fairly obvious, unless something big happens. Or let's say, uh, you know, Robin Williams, who recently died, so immediately looked on his chart. And the supermoon fell exactly on his Pluto, yeah. planet of death and rebirth. Right. Now, if somebody was really, really ill and already kind of or depressed and suicidal, as I think he was, um, then you could say, well, that's a very tricky moment. So, you know, what is it? Is it, if you can predict it, there's a certain amount of cause. It won't happen. Astrologers often say, well, nothing will happen until Jupiter goes over your midheaven. Don't say that, you know, just yes. okay. grab it out of the sky. Well, if that isn't to a certain extent causal, and on the other hand, we just don't know how it works. So it's both, uh, to answer your question, it's yes and no. Some of it might be caused simply through association. Mm. I don't know. Nobody knows. And only quantum physics can sort of maybe uh, give some rational answer to that. But then a lot of scientists don't even, you know, think quantum physics is all real because it's all subatomic and what do we know about it and how, you know, it's almost like a belief system to them as well. Um, so I think we need to be very open about it, be open-minded about it because we just don't know. You know, we haven't got a scientific answer for it yet. Um, it's experience, basically. It's, it's, it's all, um, uh, you know, our, what we see happening. And sometimes some people are very good at if they take the daily progressed angles as well, they can actually predict down to the hour when something is likely to occur, which I don't do. Yeah, with, with regard to quantum physics, I mean, the, the, there's even a name for it now, isn't there? Quantum mysticism. Because it's because it's 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 where sci it's where physics is turning into philosophy. Yes, and, yes. And, we, and we have to include okay. we have to include consciousness in the picture. Well, I have um, I've done a training <clears throat> with uh, an American called Richard Bartlett and another one called Frank Kinslow. Um, Frank Kinslow calls his work quantum entrainment, and Richard Bartlett calls it matrix energetics. Mm. And this is actually working with the body. And it is absolutely extraordinary. Um, 
it's it's like uh, it's difficult to ex to explain it. Uh, one has to experience it. I went to the, into the training because I had a shoulder injury. <coughs> Excuse me. I had a shoulder injury, and um, and I wanted to find out. Somebody told me about this, and it is nothing less the work that is done, and I've done it myself with clients of collapsing the wave into particles and allowing it to come back together as a healed part of the body. So they, these are mainly chiropractors who use it, and both the men were chiro, were are chiropractors by profession. So they literally physically collapse the wave. Yeah. Let it come together as a healthy spine, a broken bone, um, you know, provided it's done very quickly, um, various emotional things, and it, it's absolutely extraordinary. You have to see it working. So it's, it's come down from the hypothetical level to the actual hands-on everyday work. And people notice it, but people can feel it. And I've had it done on myself, and it feels very bizarre. Yeah. It feels like some entities are working on you, and you don't know where it's coming. And all the other person does is touch you with two fingers. Yeah. But now, to, to make this uh, more interesting, what actually does the work is the intention of what your intention is, what you do with it. Uh, if you look it up on the, if you look made up matrix energetics on the internet, there are a lot of people uh, giving their own accounts of how they're using this <clears throat> for anything, you know, for, for business, for finances, for bank accounts. But the main thing is that it's actually a very healing way of doing things. And it's your intention, in other words, our consciousness that directs the energy to where it wants to go and collapse the wave. And uh, to uh, enter particles and bring it back into a new wave that is a different wave, a changed wave. And because the practitioner also links to higher consciousness, uh, he or she will, will make this a positive experience rather than you know something negative. I don't know whether you can do it negatively anyway. So that's a very exciting thing, and I've been yes, doing. I've been involved with that since. 2010. So it's. I mean, yeah. it sounds it's like a, a modern version of positive thinking. Um, well, I suppose, or you could say, positive thinking is that. Uh, it's the other way around. When you yeah. think positively, you're sending out uh, um, an energy. I mean, we have to. We have to think that energy something, nothing. They are actually something. And uh, you can. Try it out yourself, you know, when you send up some healing points and works that way, or you can send somebody a message who's very upset, you know, somebody in a restaurant, for instance. You can send, you can surround them with positive thoughts and you see a change. Yeah. So they travel. I mean, Richard Bartlett, for instance, on when he gives these seminars, he will stand at the end of the hall and he will do this thing just with one hand, and the person on the stage that is being worked on falls and collapses and they catch us there, people hold them. They don't go unconscious or anything. Whew, and they come back up and there's a shift. It's, everything collapses, you know, because we have strength, that's why we can stand upright. But what he does is he collapses that, that part. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's, it's extraordinary. I'm sure a lot of people already know about this. And um, I've certainly been publicizing it and telling people to get the book <laughs> to, yeah. um, you know, to change their lives. And then there's mm. also Wayne Dyer. You've probably heard about him, one of the TED lecture speakers yeah. who has cured himself of leukemia and has totally changed his life. And he gives lectures, he's written books. And it's all about our perception and, and developing within ourselves the actual feeling of what we want to achieve, not just wishing. Because normally, when you wish for something, it means you haven't got it. So yes, exactly. Yeah. Say, act as if you've already <clears throat> got it, but you must have the feeling of it as well. Yeah. What does it feel like to be totally healthy or yeah. to be successful or confident? So um, yeah. that's what I'm at, and I absolutely love it. You know, this is where I'm, I'm a sun moon Aquarius. So I, I just this is sort of sheer gold for me. Yeah. To work yeah. on that level and that's where I'm going with that and this is how I talk with people as well to open them up to higher levels of confidence I'm, although I'm very Jungian I'm not interested in, in finding out about how mommy and daddy treated you 
and um, you know, I might ask, you know, how was it with your mother? But I, I don't, you know, rummage around in the unconscious. I say, how you, how, so, you know, how can you go on from here? Mm. What would you like to do with this? You know, and if they say, well, I want to put that all behind me, and I want to move on, I concentrate with people on where they do want to go. Yeah. Um, and it seems to be what people like because, you know, people come and see me and come back and <laughs> so on. Uh, this brings me to a sore point I have with astrology. All this business about, there was a letter in the, I think it was the Mountain Astrologer in the current round about somebody leave my mother alone. I have a real issue with astrologers insisting, many of them, that the 10th house is the mother and the 4th house is the father. Because that is just not so. It suddenly became fashionable in the 70s. And uh, how can the 10th house be the mother? You know, it's, uh, it's always been our moon, the past, where we come from. And uh, mm. in my own case, I have Aries on the midheaven, and my father is an Aries. And I have Neptune on the IC, and my, my uh, father's family have been in shipping for several generations. Mm. So that's really, you know, a very important axis. My mother is uh, is uh, represented by my moon in Aquarius. She has a moon Uranus conjunction, conjunct my own moon in yeah. Aquarius. So it's so obvious. Um, but to look for my Aries midheaven for my mother would be completely wrong. Yeah. And I think this this letter in the Mount <clears throat> Astrologer takes issue with this as well. And I really think we need to eradic eradicate that. Sure. If the father is the most passive one and you've got a strong indication on the midheaven, then the mother might have to be the man in the family. But, but that's quite a different issue from automatically looking to the 10th house for the mother. I think, I think some astrologer somewhere in the past, uh, from her own experience or his own experience, decided that this must be so. And suddenly people have taken it on board. So I do hope they, you know, they will look at look at it themselves and not try and force this into interpretation. There are various other gripes I might have, but I, you know, like the moon is so glamorized. <laughs> and I don't think the moon is anything but glamorous. This this dying rock in the sky, which is to do with the past. I I certainly don't think it, the, the moon is a glamorous part. Yeah. I think it keeps us asleep. You know, it gives us sort of, you know, oh, I have it sure nature. Oh, you know, why should yeah. I? Get up in the morning for less than ten thousand pound kind of thing. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, I've had my little rant about that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, going, uh, if we if we bring our uh, synchronicity into this, you know what we were saying about positive thinking I mean, and 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 quantum physics, insofar as intention, insofar as the broad idea of of us in here and the world out there. Um, does it not all fit together in some way? Um, well, you tell me. I'm sure there is a link on on all these um, levels. I mean, the synchronicity. People talk a lot about that. Didn't Jung mention? He mentioned that there was some. Uh, the the best way to think of it, as it were, was that there was. Instead of saying that you cause things to happen out there or you attract them, you, you know, he's, he's saying that there is some third factor, some underlying factor that brings yes. these things together, which is like what David Bohm was saying. Yes. Well, uh, from from my own point of view, um, and, and I, I do lecture on synchronicity. Um, people talk a lot about what synchronicity is, and so on, but they really are talking about coincidences, which is which is a different thing. Yeah synchronicities don't really kick in until we are on our path, until there is something in ourselves that's awakened, until I would even say the soul is awakened, awakened. And we get away from ordinary, you know, everyday humdun life and we are not yet connected to some kind of purpose. When people find the thing they want to do, whether it's a business, whether it's a relationship, whether it's, you know, astrology, Synchronistic events start to accumulate. That, to me, is when this third factor is involved, when we are actually bringing down into our life something other than ordinary, everyday, you know, Middle Earth consciousness. Um, and that could well be that 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 um, spirit of Mercurius, if you like, uh, mm -hmm. this this third factor, this unknown quantity. 
um, I know from my own life and from those of other people, and I actually promised them, I said, look, once you, once you really get on your path and you really commit yourself to this, you'll find the right people will come, the right book will come, you know, things will start to take off. And from the most hopeless situations, or some hopeless situations will suddenly turn into something that is a living entity that will move forward. And people say, guess what, you know, and then things come together, whether it's the right home, somebody offers them a bed or a job or whatever. But I think there has to be this third factor involved. You're absolutely right. And at the moment, we call it the soul, and then maybe there are other levels we can go to as well. But if soul consciousness is aware, is present, um, uh, then, um, you know, obviously we are immediately widening ourselves up to a far greater um, uh, possibility yeah. of choices. Like in that film Lucy, you know, when she gradually, she, I don't know whether you've seen the film, but she gradually develops more and more of her mental capacities until it, it's 100%. And each time she has a bit more, she sees more, she experiences more. Um, so, uh, yeah, I like to think that, that that's the same with us. And, um, you know, the poet uh, Rainer Maria Rilke once said that the problem with us, and I'm translating Lucy from German, the problem with mankind is that we are far too um, impatient. And for synchronicities to, to happen and to take place, we really do have to develop a little bit of patience for the powers that be to step in. Mm. So very often people do things too quickly and you know the whole thing goes down the tube. Um, so patience really is the thing to wait and wait and know that there is an answer, that something will come and something will step in. And that's the synchronicity when you say, guess what? Because you see, coincidence is simply that happens and that happens. And they happen together. You know, and you know, I you know, I went shopping, and I met my grandmother who hadn't seen for two weeks. That's a silly coincidence. Yeah. But a synchronicity is an outer event that happens to you combined with an inner event that is very, very significant to you. Yeah. Where you go, my God, guess what? I've been thinking about this, and then this happens. For instance, you know, it's a very simple thing that I'm thinking of right now. Um, I was thinking at one point that I'd like to train in rebirthing. I didn't know anything about it, but the idea was in my mind. And I went to, and we were living on a houseboat here in Chelsea at the time, and we went to a, a, a lunch party down the road, and I was talking to this woman, and um, she turned out to be a neighbor on another houseboat a few down. And, I, and we were talking, well, what are you doing now? But I said to her, well, what I really like to do is train as a rebirther. She said, I want you. She said, my, you, my houseboat is used for the training. And we've got a new, next weekend, be starting a new course. Yeah. That's a synchronicity. It was, to me, it was a miracle. And it was, <laughs> all I had to do is walk down the pontoons and start the training. And within a year, I was actually helping to teach the course. So it, it was, again, one of those things like with astrology, that yes. it was a synchronistic event. There was something other that other at work that is saying, go and talk to her about this. That's the person you should talk to. There were about 100 people at this party. So, yeah. I mean, um, <laughs> I happened to, we had only recently moved to this place, so I, I didn't know that she lived there. Um, so, you know, that's a synchronicity. It's not yeah. a coincidence. Yes, it's something significant happening at the right time. Yes, you know, it's got to have real meaning, and you go, wow, oh, my God, how on earth did I get to talk to this person and tell her about myself? Because, you know, I'm really not that forthcoming at a party and telling everybody what I'm doing. <laughs> so, um, I mean, what do you think about the collective unconscious? Well, Is... I think we've more or less covered that, you know, that greater whole. That's the, that great cloud of all noble is, is that the, the kind of thing that, that we've been alluding to, that this underlying reality? Yes, we all, I mean... We, or we the just, anima mundi. Yes, absolutely. We've all been, uh, we all know, for instance, that we know things we don't know. But just look at children. You know, where does that come from? You know, they have learned it in school. When I was four years old, my father was doing homework with my, my sister was two years older, and she struggled. And I gave the answers. And he said, because I remember that, because he said, look, 
she doesn't even go to school yet and she knows but I didn't know that I knew and I yeah. can't even remember saying it all I remember what my father said because I felt sorry for my sister and apparently you know I did know that so well apparently um, have you heard of Noam Chomsky no is uh, is American uh, is is trained in, in linguistics. He's he's really a, he does a lot of political commentary, um, but he's given evidence that that language, uh, insofar as syntax, is innate. So children know the order of the words before they know what they mean. Ah, oh, wow! Well, that Syn is syntax somehow we already know it. I need to look at that. <laughs> And it's all there, all the geniuses, you know, the children are born with, you know, when I asked my, my son when he was very little, I was just going to find out what he might think. I said, he was, you know, very little, I mean, before he went to nursery school. And I said, where do you think you go to when you die? You already knew that we might die. He said, well, it's obvious, isn't it? I go back to where I came from. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, he, he hadn't learned anything about reincarnation or anything like that. And other things as well that, that we all know that children are aware of and their psychological awareness is amazing. Their sense of fairness yeah. and justice is extraordinary. It's only parents who mess it up. And I'm afraid nowadays they yeah. get messed up a lot, don't they, by yeah. pressure I mean, cook to get all their A-levels and all stuff yeah. like that. Um, but children are amazing and even animals are amazing. They are yeah, sure. Yeah, it's. I mean, it, this is not unknown to uh, some of the old philosophers. I mean, Kant talked about a priori knowledge, didn't he? Yes, you know, Things that we already know instinctively. Yeah. yeah, we don't come in here with a, you know, with an empty brain, and we have to stuff it full. We just uh, what Plato talked about, it doesn't it? We it just, yeah, sure, it's, platonic images. Yeah. yeah. So I think, although I can't tell you what the collective unconscious is, we all know <laughs> it exists because I work with dreams a lot, and it's amazing how I work for with a person for, right now on Skype. We, we do astrology, but we also do therapy. Yeah. Now she's somebody who's had a very privileged upbringing and and knows nothing about these things. Her dreams are extraordinary. She dreamed of an apocalypse the other day, and she got together in her dream with her friends, for instance, to um, uh, to these were aliens that were attacking our planet, and you know you can think of the Arab Spring and all of this. And uh, and she said she and her friends got together and tried to write a message to these powers in their language, and the message message said, "Only love can bring peace." Yeah. And then she had another dream about again about a very um, you know I mean all her dreams are archetypal and she does not read this she is into partying but she's going through a phase where she's becoming really discontented with it so again he, he she's arrived at a place where she can only go up reaching upward and the, these dreams do not come out of our work together you know I'm astonished that she has these because a lot of people who seem to be incredibly aware don't have these dreams mm. And she has them. She has them for us, you know, for, yeah. for to have a look at. Yeah, sure. So I think it goes without saying that the collective unconscious exists. And uh, I know <laughs> Dawkins trying to do his best to get away, <laughs> get rid of it. Um, but uh, then he's got his own problems to look at, and maybe one day he will, um, <laughs> you know, come round to it. Wonder what his dreams are like. <laughs> Given that um, computer programs are everywhere these days, I mean, how important is it to be able to use an ephemeris? Well, I use them all the time. We have one on the kitchen table, so uh, that's the one we use most of all, rather than going on the computer. For, for everyday use, we use, my husband and I both, he knows astrology too, we use the ephemeris. So if there's a certain something happening, we quickly have a look, God, oh, what's going on? Is Mercury still retrograde? You know, so we're using it in day to day, you know, has the sun gone into Virgo yet, you know, and things like that. So for day to day use, I don't use the computer. Yeah. I turn it on when I want to get a chart done, but I don't use it to to just have a look what's happening in the sky. That's far too complicated, you know. So um, I mean, having an ephemeris is, is important. We have one on every floor. We've got a three story house. We've got one on every floor of the house, and my husband has his own as well in his study. So um, because he uses it with his clients too, um, I I think it's a, it's a very important one. Since 1972, I have never gone without one, 
I usually order four or five at a time. Uh, it's usually five. And um, uh, this is the Raphael's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I started with one, but then you know, as I realized, I would need one in the kitchen. I need one in my handbag when I go traveling. Uh, we need one in each study, and we need one in the bedroom. Because when we talk about what's going on in the sky, I like to look it up. I'm not very good at remembering that everything is. Uh, so I need to look it up, you know. And the slower moving, the faster moving planets, of course, they move on so quickly that you don't realize they've gone 10 degrees further. Yeah, I think it's important. And I think Raphael and Femus will go on forever. I think it's just such an important. You can't replace it with a computer. Um, I don't even have a little app. I mean, I, I learned with the Raphaels. When I started yeah. to study astrology in 72, we didn't have a computer program, I don't think. Uh, I didn't have a computer until, oh, I don't know, sometimes in the, in the um, early 80s, I think. Or, yeah, probably early 80s, I got my first computer. So I learned with Raphael Ephemeris to calculate my charts, the logarithms and the back and all of that stuff. In fact, I could do it... Because I had a sort of twin computer with twin disks, I was I was quicker calculating it, my charts with Raphael Ephemeris and booting up my computer and putting the program in. So I, I didn't bother for a long time until I got a more sophisticated computer eventually. Thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> so I would give it a strong plug at any time. You know, I mean, it's, it's amazing. That's marvellous. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, like I say, we are out of time now, but it's been absolutely marvellous talking to you. I really, well, really enjoyed it. If you want anything to it, you can do it at another time, you know, when you, we haven't covered it all. I think we probably more or less have, haven't we?